I think I'm just going to sit in here for a little bit and stroke my doll. Does that work for you, Jared? Jared says it works for him. All right, folks, it's a Monday, and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host. Am I your host? Am I am your host, Professor Paul Markle. And the uh, for those of you that are curious, we got a whole bunch of suggestions for the uh, the shaky doll. That was the those of you who follow us on social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or what have you. You know about the the stress relief doll, the the shaky stress relief doll that Mrs. Markle gave me for Christmas, and it's got a it's a it's a ty beanie baby kind of a thing, and it it has a name, but the name just doesn't it just didn't work for us, and so Jared put a a little thing out and he said name the shaky stress relief doll, and we put it's not a contest or anything. A lot of you folks have sent in suggestions. Some of you have sent in suggestions for names that would like that I would dislike or hate or despise, and I don't really despise my shaky doll here. I mean, I didn't want to call it, you know, Comrade Barry or anything like that. But uh, somebody said, "Tickle me ammo," and so, and I thought that was pretty funny. So we're just going to call it "Tickle me ammo" from now. On. <laughs> And for those of you that have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, A, you need to catch up, and B, uh, you need to follow us on Instagram or – Jared, is your microphone on? Yeah, it's on now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and that is Jared, and we are in the Glass Case of Emotion Studios for yet another week of Student of the Gun. But where would you post it? You put the picture on Instagram, right? And then you also put it on the I'm mobile. pretty sure I put it on Facebook, Instagram, and the mobile app. Yeah, the mobile app. If you guys don't have the mobile app yet, shame on you, but it's super simple. Just go ahead and uh, go to either the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store and type in the words Student of the Gun, and it'll pop up, and you can download it for free. You know why you can download it for free? Why is that, Jared? Why is it free to them? It's free to them because of our good friends at Century International Arms. Um, They take care of all the – actually, I take care of all the back-end issues of the app, but they make it possible by – Sponsoring it. Sponsoring the app. That yes. way we don't have to charge you. Uh, you're like, it's well, free. shouldn't apps be free? <laughs> Good apps. Yeah, go build an app and tell me how free it is. If you want a Support bunch of, an app. If you want, want a bunch of ads in your app, yes, it's usually free. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's the, the only ad or the only sponsor link really is, is for Century because they're the sponsor. Uh, we don't push out a bunch of random like ads. And, we don't do like Google AdSense in there. Yeah, none of that. So uh, – all right, folks, we talked about that. Let's talk about uh, where, where we are going for in the future. The next big thing that we're going to be doing is the NRA annual meeting, and that's coming up in Nashville. Uh, it's in Nashville, Tennessee, April 10th, 11th, and 12th. Uh, if you're going to be there, we hope you're going to be there. And we, we talked about it on Friday, and uh, hopefully you grad program members uh, really enjoyed Friday's show. We were excited to put Friday's show together. Uh, that exclusive interview that we did with Ken Hackathorn. Ken is legitimately a living legend in the firearms training world. Uh, between Ken and uh, John Farnham and maybe Clint Smith and uh, essentially a handful of others, they have you know, 30, 40 years of experience being there and doing that and uh, being deeply immersed in the firearms training culture in the United States of America. And we were uh, very gratified. I've known Ken for many years. And uh, we were gratified to be able to get him on the phone and do an interview for you guys. But uh, during, in addition to the interview, during Friday's show, we talked about the NRA, right, Jared? I believe so. Yeah, we talked. Well, we talked about the shirts. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, about we're gonna, between Jared and I and Zachary, we're bringing Zachary for those of you who have never seen him or met him. We're going to bring him to the NRA show as well, and we're going to have a pocket full of official student of the gun stickers. The high quality vinyl stickers we're going to have those on us and if we either we run into you or you run into us and you're wearing a student of the gun shirt we're going to give you one for free but not just the student of the gun shirts the student of the gun shirts the official ones or a patriot fire team shirt or the aafu shirt and jared have you made that public on the uh we talked about it on nope. on friday oh yeah well what we're gonna... on, on friday's bonus hour no we talked about it but have you given everybody an update on the radio yet about um, 
the American Association of Firearms Users. No, I didn't do that publicly yet. AAFU. AAFU. That actually, for those of you in the grad program, you guys got the announcement on Friday. But I will tell everybody, if you can hear my voice, I'm going to announce it to you right now. The AAFU, American Association of Firearms Users, which was born in uh, episode 129, I believe, of Student of the Gun Radio. So go check that out. You can kind of look and see or listen and see where it originated from. But that is going to be a real-life thing now, American Association of Firearms Users. Uh, We're going to launch that hopefully by this weekend. We're going to have pre-orders available for the shirts, definitely. Uh, The grad program members will get a special discount code on Friday, and they will be the first ones that are available or that are able to get these shirts. So once we get that out of the way, once we make it available to the grad program, then next week I will come and announce it to you guys. We might give you a discount code. I don't. I, I think only the grad pro- program members will get a special discount. Well, right now, if if you now the grad program members can go in right now and take a look, anybody can go uh, to American Association of Fu. dot com. There's a little. I think I've still got the yeah American Association of Fu. dot com. I've got the little the launching soon. Yeah, we got a countdown, and we're actually going to launch sooner than that countdown because we've been uh, really hitting it hard. Uh, our buddy Jeremy, he was very proactive with this. But anyway, there's a little thing there where if you enter your email address, you'll get a special discount just for giving us your email. Uh, it's not going to be near as much as the grad program members get, but that is what happens when you enter your email address. Okay, cool. And uh, the the uh, the catchphrase for the American Association of Firearms Uner- Users is because we don't need your permission. That's why. So... All right, that's coming up uh, very soon. And there's going to be an adult one that comes out for the grad program members <laughs> Are only. you going to make that? Really? Uh, yeah, I think we're going to make it for just, just – it'll be a limited edition. Only grad program members gonna, can get it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. And that's what happens here on Student of the Guns. Things just happen. Sometimes we're we're trucking along and, and little mental bombs just go poof, poof, poof. Sometimes we're SWAT fueled up and all the ideas are just – they're – Falling out of our ears. <laughs> All right, it is Monday, so that means that uh, we've got our Exercise Good Guy of the Week, uh, because it is a Monday. And Jared's going to tell you who the Good Guy of the Week is, what they need to do to claim their prize, and uh, what their question was. Before I get into the Good Guy of the Week this week, I want to take a moment to thank our friends at Velocity Triggers. They're designed for precision. And also our friends at Brownells, since they're serious about firearms since 1939. If you own a gun, Brownells has something for you. And now let me get into this week's Good Guy. Our Good Guy this week is Matt Margush, and I believe that he actually just subscribed to the grad program. I saw his name in my email address. Oh, very cool. Uh, Thank you for joining us in the grad program, Matt. We appreciate your support, and you will love the content that we give you. I need you to send me your name, mailing address, phone number, shirt size, and include your email typed in there. Uh, send it. Actually, don't send it to me. Send it to Alex, A-L-E-X, at studentofthegun.com, and uh, she will get the information over to Excess so they can get you your good guy pack. And Matt says that the pink box that says Paul Markle in it is in front of my words, and I can't read them. Can you move your cursor? Uh, I did move my Thank cursor. You. Yeah, now I can read it. Matt says, in regards to CCW, <laughs> two is one and one is none mindset. What methods do you use to carry two pieces, in particular during summer slash hot weather? Uh, okay, is your is your computer refreshed yet? Because it, yeah, it's it, out of my way now. Oh, okay, it All just right. it just moved. Uh, you want me to <laughs> ask the other question too, or you want to answer? Uh, oh, first? So, all right. Well, here it says uh, regarding. Uh, the, the two is one and, one and one is none. How do you carry in hot weather? Uh, how, do how do you carry, I carry or two, how does anyone? Two pieces in hot weather. Well, first of all, you, you need to have your, your primary or your number one or what have you. And uh, I use a, a crossbreed holster super tuck in, in pretty much not all weather. You know, when, it, when it's cooler I, I will, and I'm wearing an overgarment, a sweatshirt uh, or long sleeve shirt or something like that, Sometimes I'll just wear a regular outside of the waistband holster. Uh, but if it's warm and I'm going to wear only a T-shirt or only a polo shirt or what have you, then what I'll do is I'll use an inside the waistband holster like the Super Tuck. Uh, well, not like the Super Tuck, the Super Tuck. Uh, 
Now, as far as secondary guns, this is where a pocket gun really uh, comes into its own. Uh, for instance, let's say you're wearing the your ubiquitous cargo shorts in the summertime. You've got a baggy T-shirt on. You've got cargo shorts and flip-flops. Well, you could wear a gun over your right or left hip, whichever handed you happen to be, and then you slip another one into a front pocket. And we don't just slip guns naked into our pockets, do we, Jared? No, Jared says, no, we don't do that. We always make sure that they're in some type of a pocket holster or a pocket scabbard or what have you. People are like, it's not a scabbard, man, it's a holster. It doesn't have belt loops on it. It just covers the thing. And if I want to call it a pocket scabbard, I will call it a pocket scabbard for that one person out there that it bothers. And uh, don't You're tell just going to call it a scabbard from now on. Yeah, that's right, from now on. Oh. Uh, so anyway, long story short is, uh, and he's like, well, and, and what do you feel, how do you feel about carrying extra magazines and so forth? All right. Well, uh, my friend Jay Gibson, we, we, he likes to call it a, a spare gun or a second gun. He likes to call it a reload with a gun wrapped around it. And uh, we like to say here that, uh, that our spare ammo has its own launching device. Now, if it comes down to, would you, you know, Let's let's face it. You don't want to carry 15 pounds worth of gear on you every day. You don't even want to carry five pounds worth of gear on you. I probably have, I probably have five pounds worth of gear on me right now between two guns, a pocket knife, a flashlight, a PLS. PLS only weighs like three ounces. Uh, but anyway, oh, speaking of PLS, did we announce that we have orange tourniquets? No, we didn't announce that. Well, now we did. Okay. We have orange rats tourniquets in stock now. Yes, we have the, the fluorescent Dayglo orange rats tourniquets uh, are on the shop right now. So we we, we kind of just, we didn't even advertise the fact. We just, we got some of them and we put them in the store and then all of a sudden people got interested. So we ordered a bunch more and so, all right, they're there. But, and they, and no, we don't have pocket lifesavers with the orange ones in it yet. If you want an orange one, you have to order it separate. But, and if you, if you want one, go to studentofthegungear.com. There you go. All right, and, but I digress. Uh, if it came down to, let's say you're carrying a G19, and you say, well, should I carry uh, an extra magazine for the G19, or should I carry a pocket pistol, uh, if, you know, ounces to ounces? And I would say, I personally, I would carry the secondary launching device over the, the extra ammo. Now, if you want to carry the extra ammo, great. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is uh, if, if you lose the one gun or the one gun breaks or goes down or whatever, it doesn't matter how many reloads you have for that gun, it's not going to help you. But if you have, uh, for instance, a secondary gun, uh, it's all, you always have like the two is one, one is none. So that's what I would do. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, I found ever since I started carrying concealed, um, going back 20-plus years, 20, I don't know, how, however long it's been since I became a police officer back in the early 90s, uh, carrying off-duty or carrying concealed, I found that actually carrying the spare ammo was more of a problem or, or more of a pain in the rump than actually carrying the gun itself. I, and I've talked to a lot of other guys, and they said, yeah, you know, that's – I found the same thing. There, there was a company out there, and I don't know if they still do it, that was making essentially it was like a pocket rue, like a pocket holster, only it was for magazines. And because you, you, if you've ever tried to carry a spare magazine discreetly, just dropped into a pocket, what do you always find out? That it shifts around, or even if it doesn't shift around and bother you, you pull it out, and it's it's like got it's full of lint and nastiness and so forth. Uh, and I can't remember who it was, but it was essentially they made it like out of the same material as a pocket holster, but it was for like a G19 magazine or, or a G17 magazine or whatever. And I suggested that to our friends at Tough Products. Tough Products doesn't sponsor us now, but I suggested that they make one of those. And they're like, well, really? Do you think anybody would buy one? And I'm like, yeah, I think they would buy them. Um, let's face it. If you're going to carry spare ammo or spare ammunition, an extra magazine – the last thing you want is is just this like half a pound, you know, six seven ounce magazine just bouncing around in your pocket all day. It's not going to be comfortable. And what'll happen is because it's not comfortable, you'll stop doing it. You'll do it for a week, and you'll be like, "Yeah, it was a pain in my rump. I'm gonna stop doing it." When it comes down to it, you need to set up your gear and have it on your body. So, and I understand Clint Smith saying that a, you know a gun is not supposed to be comfortable; it's supposed to be comforting. Yeah, I get that part. It but, could be both, though. Well, right. Yeah, but the thing is, if it gets to the point where it becomes an annoyance or it interferes with your daily activities, what you will do, is because you're a human, is you'll just stop carrying it. 
and then you won't have it when you need it. That's the whole that's the whole purpose behind the pocket lifesaver, and I'm really not trying to pimp it, but the whole purpose of the pocket lifesaver is something that you can actually have on your body. You know, everybody's got all this cool gee whiz stuff, but they don't actually carry it on them. And let's face it, if you have a two thousand dollar traumatic medicine kit and it's locked in the trunk of your car and the person who's bleeding to death is a thousand yards away from the trunk of your car, it doesn't really do you any good, now does it? We've actually got a video on the store of the pocket lifesaver being used. So Oh yeah, go, that's right. Yeah, go check it out. All right. So uh uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Matt, I hope that uh, answered your question for you. Thank you for posting that on the forums. That's uh, what he did. Oh, uh, something else that we're we're doing. And did we answer the did we answer the uh, questions last week? Was it last week or the week before that we on answered the, the questions app. from the mobile app? Somebody wants to know about twenty two ammo, or is it ever going to come back? And here's what I'm going to tell you: No. What? What do you mean no? Well. I'm going to say no because the reason I'm saying no is until we get rid of the openly hostile administration that's in Washington, D.C., 22 ammo is never going to come back. Wow, that's a pretty negative outlook you got there, Paul. Well, maybe it is. But, folks, let's let's face it. Every time it looks like things are going to normalize, every th- time it looks like the gun world, the ammunition world is going to calm down. Things are going to go back to the way they were, you know, maybe five, six, seven years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Every time it appears is that things have calmed down. The ammo makers are going to start catching up, you know, with the thousands and thousands of back orders. Every time that happens, somebody in Washington, D.C. opens their big mouth and starts spouting off about gun control or confiscation, or bans, or this or that. Have you noticed? Have you noticed that? What was happening in the uh, in the world? Well, two two. Th- oh, and I told you guys this. What was it? A, a week or two ago, we talked about ammo, and I said, "Hey, the good news is, you know, I'm, I've been going online and I've been looking at nine mil practice ammo, two two three practice ammo, and so forth. And not only is it available, but the prices are coming back down." If you can pay in this day and age, if you can pay less than 35 cents a shot for 223 ammo, you're doing good. The closer to 30 you get, the better. If you get below 30, buy now. <laughs> it's kind of like the start stock market. If you see a thousand rounds of 223 from a, a reputable manufacturer and it's less than 30 cents a round, buy it right now. Uh, so we had that situation happening, and then what happened? Well, then the uh, the the uh, um, Watching my mouth because this isn't the bonus R. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, Explosives, and Potato Chips decided just on their own that, well, we're not so sure that you peasants should be allowed to have this ammo. And now they're going out on the floor of Congress talking about, well, you know, all right, all rifle ammunition is a a problem or is, it pre- presents a challenge for fire for officer safety. Yeah, that was the exact quote from that douche nozzle was. That uh, AR-15 rifle ammunition presents a challenge for officer safety. Wu sent me a, an email earlier, I think it was last week, that had a video of a lady talking about how it's ridiculous that this uh, the school shooters had 30-round magazines and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. She said something about limiting them to 10-round magazines, and then she accidentally slipped in there that 10 was too many but that's a different subject that she needs she doesn't want to talk about that right now yeah well what do we what have we told you and we, we've we, we told you this uh over and over and over again that it's never ever ever enough they, they don't ever they don't ever pass gun control and say Whew, okay that was good that ban that restriction that limitation that's all we need and we're done now and we're not going to mess around with that anymore. No, they don't ever do that. They always come around a year or two later, and sometimes it's not even a year or two. Sometimes it's six months later, and saying, "Well, yeah, you know, that was a step in the right direction, but it just wasn't enough. We need to do more." But they never talk about criminals. You know, what? I don't want to talk about any more of that jazz. Uh, so we're done talking about that. The main topic of today is called the tactical brain, and you're like, "What? What is this tactical brain thing all about?" 
Well, I'm going to tell you. Here at Student of the Gun University, we're all about education, enlightenment, and entertainment when it comes to firearms. Right? And Here, enjoyment as and well. And enjoyment, yeah. So, but, and, and we, we've had... We've we've had lots of time to enjoy firearms, you know, back in the in the eighties and the nineties and even in the two thousands, when we when we thought, well, yeah, we know that we've got the Brady campaign and we've got the this and we've got the that, but they can make all the noise we want they want, you know, and say what you would about George Bush, but George Bush was never going to sign another Clinton era crime bill. George Bush wasn't going to put his name on a crime bill. You know, if they put a, an assault weapons ban bill in front of George Bush, George Bush probably, I don't say probably, he wouldn't have. He would not have signed that. Well, here we are in the new enlightened era where we are legitimately afraid that Congress will put something together and stick it in front of Comrade Barry and he'll put a signature on it. So... We can't really, we don't have the time or the, I guess, the luxury to just play with guns anymore. You're like, play with guns? Come on now, Paul. What do you mean play with guns? I don't play with guns. I'm serious. Well, no. I would rather not have to think about this nonsense. I would rather just be able to take a rifle or a shotgun, go out to the field, shoot some birds, you know, shoot some, some freaking prairie dogs, Go out and, and pop a whole bunch of you know uh, you know beer cans or soup cans or pop cans or whatever off of the fence posts. I would rather just go out and enjoy myself and relax. That's really what I would rather do. And I would like to to come to you and talk to you about the two hundred four Ruger versus the two twenty Swift versus the twenty two two fifty. You know all these fun things that we used to be able to do, and we can still do them. But the problem is. If you're out playing and you're not paying attention, you're going to come back from playing and the game's going to be over. So we have to sharpen our minds. And a lot of you folks have gone out there. Uh, you've gone out. You've purchased ammunition. You've purchased guns. You've purchased accessories. I know a lot of you folks out there, I know that you have a safe full of 30-round magazines. That you <laughs> that you're like uh, whatever you can ban green tip all you want I can shoot I can start shooting green tip today and I wouldn't run out until next year I know that those that you guys are out there and that's great rock on so what do you do now what do you do after you've bought the stuff after you've purchased the gear I mean we can't buy our way out of this problem there is no amount of ammunition or magazines or guns that we can purchase to purchase our way out of the current predicament that we find ourselves in. In order to get ourselves out of this, to rescue the nation, we're going to have to have strong tactical minds. You're going to have to have a strong, determined mind and if your brain is not up to speed, if your mind is not up to speed, if you're not educated, then it doesn't matter how many guns you have. If you can't win an argument, if you can't make a point, if you don't understand what your rights and duties are, and not just rights. We talk about this all the time. People are like, it's my right. This is my right. I have a right to this, a right to that. All these rights, 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 rights. Everybody in the world, everyone in the United States of America especially, believes that they have a right to everything they want. Well, you can't have rights without responsibilities. And you can't have liberty without civic duty. That's one of the reasons that I don't throw out the word freedom all the time. Because people are always like, I have the freedom to say what I want. I have the freedom to do what I want. I have the freedom, 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 freedom. We, you can't live in a country where you can can say and do anything you want with no consequences or with no thought about the future or no thought about the present. Liberty requires civic duty. Liberty requires responsibility. And to understand that, you've got to be educated. You have to refer back to where we came from. And I'm going to tell you about a book that I've been reading. It's called The John Locke Collection. And I bought it off of Amazon. Uh, 
it's a it's a the great thing about the modern world that we live in is that a lot of these books that are listed on Amazon are what they call print on demand books. And they don't have to, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if a book was, you know, if a book stopped being popular or, you know, fell off the top 100, top 200, top whatever list, they would just stop printing them. They wouldn't make any more because they couldn't afford to print books, stick them in a warehouse, stick them on shelves and not sell them. It was taking up space. You just You can't do it. And so what they would do is they'd periodically go through the list. Publishers would go through the list of books, and they're like, okay, we haven't sold two of those books in the last five years. We're done. It's going out of print. We're not going to make any more of them. Well, well, the great thing about living in the current modern era is it doesn't matter if they sell two or four or a 1,000. The print on demand literally means this. You go onto Amazon, you're like, hey, I'm interested in that. You pay for it. You order it. They put the order through. They print that book. It's not sitting on the shelf with dust on it waiting for you to order it. They actually make you a new one, and they send it to you. And that's uh, that's what the, the – there's a lot of books out there right now that you can get that are that they do that. And that's a pretty big deal, actually. Uh, because I would say if we didn't have that ability, a lot of the material that you need to read, that you should read, wouldn't be available. And the reason I brought up John Locke is if you guys have uh, – if you've read the, the political thought of the American Revolution by Clinton Rossiter, like I told you you should have, uh, if you cannot find it – here, folks, get online and hunt that book down. Find that book. And in that book, there's a lot of references or several references to John Locke. You're like, who's this John Locke character? John Locke was a, was a philosopher, and a political philosopher and a religious philosopher that lived in the late 1600s. And a lot of his books and papers were published. And Jefferson and Adams and Washington and Madison and Hamilton, all these guys, all of our founding fathers, uh, when they were putting together the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, the United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and so forth, when they were writing all those things, when they were putting them together, when they were assembling them, they used, they relied heavily upon the works of John Locke. And if you're looking it up, it's L-O-C-K-E. John Locke was actually, he was from England. Uh, but he has a lot to say about the state of nature and nature's laws, how man is born into a state of nature with freedom and liberty to do what he pleases, and that they come into, voluntarily, they come into a state of society or a state of civilization, and they form governments amongst themselves in order to maintain order for the people. But that's a voluntary process. And Locke basically, he states that it needs to be voluntary. If it's not voluntary, then you have tyranny, then you have despotism. You, you shouldn't ha- men should not have to be forced into a society or forced to accept a certain government. And it's, it's a, uh, I'm going to say it's a difficult read, as in it's not Dr. Seuss, it's not Cat in the Hat. It's actually, the, the sad, you know what's sad, Jared? What is that? Um, is that... I'm reading books that were written in the late 1600s, early, you know, 1700s, late 1700s, and the vocabulary and the understanding of the English language that those people possessed. How did how have we gotten to the point where we've yeah, you know, everyone's like, "Oh man, kids today. Oh, kids today, Paul, you don't know how much it, how advanced these kids today are so much more advanced than we, we were. Not uh, mentally. No, I don't not. know what you're. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know where people base that argument on. Except that it's not really an argument. It's just a blanket statement that has no basis in support. Uh, I, I would say that unfortunately, if you were to hand the Federalist Papers, the works of John Locke, a lot of those things to a an eighteen year old today, that they wouldn't recognize half of the words. Never, none and wouldn't know the definition of them either. Uh, it's sad that you're like, well, how is it that in this great age of information that we've fallen to that point? And I think part of the reason that we've, we've fallen to this state is because we are in the age of information, you know, the great enlightened era where all this information is available. And whereas 50 years ago, 100 years ago, People understood, adults understood that it was their duty to pass on the lessons of the past of their lifetime 
and those that came before them. It was their duty to ensure that their children and the you know their posterity that they knew that they would pass those lessons on, and they and they took the time to very deliberately do that. And what we've got now is we have adults that feel like, well, everything's available on the internet, so they don't take the time and they don't really view it as their responsibility to ensure that the upcoming generation understands the lessons of the past. They just take it as a given. Well, they'll they'll learn it. They'll read it. They'll know it. How? Having access to information and having intelligence are not the same thing. They're not even close to being the same thing. And you're like, okay, Paul, big deal. It is a big deal because you know, uh, I don't have the book in front of me right now. It's actually over on that table right over there, Jared. Um, the uh, the John the, it's called the the John Locke collection, and it's a, it's a group of papers. But when you read through it, there are warnings that Locke gives about formation of government and the the uh, tyranny of government, or what a government is capable of doing if it's not checked properly. If the people, he was giving these warnings in 1685. In like 1698, he was giving out these warnings. And you read it and you say, that's happening today. This guy knew. You know, what did, what did King Solomon say? There is nothing new under the sun. And it's in, that's in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes. But there's nothing new under the sun. You go back and you read the Federalist Papers, and as I'm going to say it again because some of you still don't get it, people think that the Federalist Papers is an argument for a centralized bureaucracy that has complete control over everyone's life. And they're like, uh, that's, that's no good, man. We don't need that. We don't need that. No, you read the Federalist Papers. You go through it, and it was, you know, the, there are various papers that were published um, before the, the, you know, the ratification of the United States Constitution figure around 1788 time frame. And you read the warnings that are put down by Madison and Hamilton and Jay, and you're like, dude, these guys told us if we didn't, if we didn't follow the steps, if we didn't pay attention, if we didn't hold our government accountable, if we didn't hold them to the separation of powers, if we don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And they warned us 200 plus years ago, it was laid out and they said, hey, this is what you need to do. This is what we're giving you. This is what we're providing. This is the framework. And you need to follow this framework because if you don't, these things are going to happen. I w- my mind was blown when I was reading the Federalist Papers, and I can't remember which one it was. I'm going to actually, I've got a, forgive me while I've got a hard copy and I open it up right now. And uh, will you? Well, yeah, the. Uh... The problem is if you don't teach the younger generation, my generation doesn't know about this. They weren't they weren't uh, required to read the Federalist Papers or the political thought of the Revolu- the American Revolution or the John Locke Collection. We don't have that information. Uh, some of us do because our parents taught us, but the majority of my generation and oh, the generations below me, I I really feel sorry for them because. The parenting now, the parenting from the generation that's below me is way worse than my generation's parenting. And there's warnings. I'm trying to look at. Oh, here we go. There, there's in in book or in paper number eight. They uh, they warn. Who wrote paper number eight? Let me look. Uh, Hamilton wrote paper number number eight, and he warns about the the rise of the police state and the use of military power in in civil justice. They warned about the – essentially, in 1788, they wrote warnings that if you don't follow these following steps, then the nation will devolve into the state of civil war. They predicted the the American Civil War in the Federalist Papers. They said, look, you have to do this, this, and this, and if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Folks, I'm telling you. You need to make these things available to yourselves. I'm not making any money by telling you read the Federalist Papers. I'm not making any money by telling you to read the John Locke Collection uh, or the political thought of the American Revolution. I tell you what, Jared, I really wish this book, like I, we've, we've told you, this book was actually, it used to be, the one I've got in my hands, in my hot little hands right now, 
came from the Social Studies Department, Ann Arbor Huron High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's stamped in the front. And the other one I have at home, I've got two copies of it because it's so valuable. I don't want to. I want to make sure that I always have one. But uh, the other one was has a, a library stamp in it. These books used to be used in high school and college classes, and they stopped using them. And I, quite frankly, I believe that they stopped using them when we got into the like the peace, love, dope seventies generation, where oh, we don't want to talk about why the country was formed and how it was formed and the thought that went into it because that would require that we actually acknowledge that the people who founded this nation knew what they were talking about and that you as a citizen have to be held accountable for your actions. You have a civic duty. You can't just, you're like, well, what do you mean? I pay my taxes. Oh, great. Slaves pay taxes. Congratulations. You pay taxes. And... Uh, speaking of that argument or this subject, uh, we've got a special guest coming up this Friday's grad program on the bonus hour. We've basically we map what you need to do. We've got um, the the real triple B mm-hmm. is going to be on with us, and he is an attorney, a lawyer. He's going to give you his advice on what to do in your local communities. Things that you know, positive things that you can do to make a difference. Yeah, and it's. It's pretty much mapping what you need to do. It's kind of like us giving you a spoken copy of the Student of the Gun papers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the real Triple B. You got a lot of you may know him. His name's Bob, but a lot of you may know him from his YouTube channel. It's called the Real Triple B on uh, YouTube, and he kind of came to notoriety when he explained the uh, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the BLM situation. Uh, after the Bundy Ranch incident. And I think I, I looked on his site, Jared. That's the A number one video on his site is, yeah. the, is the Bundy Ranch and the BLM explanation. But it, it's 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 so good and it's so well thought out and it's so simple that even a Democrat can understand it. So uh, We've played it on, on the radio before. <clears throat> Did we? Yeah. That one? I, I don't know. Maybe we should do that. I don't know. But uh, anyway, so yeah, that's coming up on the uh, the grad program the end of this week. So you, we, if you're excited about this, you can get even farther in, in the details about it. But and That brings me to uh, another point on this subject is if you're a parent, if you can hear my voice and you're a parent, are you involved in your kid's school? Not when your kid come home comes home from school, I'm sure you ask him how school went that day and all that jazz. But do you physically go to the school and make yourself known as the parent of that child? Are you involved in parent teacher conferences? Do you communicate with your kid's parent? I mean, your, your kid's parents, your kid's parents, your kid's teachers. Your I kids don't principal. communicate with my kid's parents at all. Yeah. Do you do that? And if not, why not? And is, is it just you? you yeah. Know, get, and, get your, uh, yeah, and that's, friends you know, together. that's the thing is, you know, you, you know, when, when you, when you exceed your 90 seconds and they're going to have have you arrested, um, should they have to just arrest you for exceeding the 90-second rule, or uh, will there be 20 or 30 other people or 50 other people there that all stand up and say, well, if you're going to arrest him, then you better arrest all 50 of us. And let me tell you what, the first PTA meeting, PTO meeting, whatever, where they, they start handing your kids out Sharia pamphlets or, or whatever, and you go to protest and they tell you to shut up and sit down, let 50 parents stand up and lock arms and say, no, we're not shutting up. Oh, I'm going to have this officer remove you. You better go get some more officers because there's 50 of us, and we're not backing down. The schools belong to you. You guys understand that, right? They don't belong to the school board. They don't belong to the teachers. They don't belong to the principals. They belong to you. You pay for them. They belong to the people that pay for them. Don't let them shut you up. Don't let them back you down. Don't let them make you sit down and shut your mouth. You're not a slave. You're not a peasant. You're footing the bill. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But, yeah, when it comes to education, you need to have a tactical brain. You need to understand and I'm, I'm telling you, folks, these books, I can't believe they haven't banned them. I can't believe that they haven't tried to hide these books. I can't believe that the uh, the uh, Zuckerbergs and, and people haven't, you know, taken them down uh, because we can't have the peasants reading and finding out what their rights and responsibilities as a citizen are. Uh, it's amazing to me. You know, other countries, there's lots of other countries in, that have banned books that have approved reading lists. 
Uh, we already know that they, they've decided that, that the courts have decided that approved firearms lists are somehow constitutional. So why not an approved reading list? All right. The next part we're going to talk about, we're going to move on and uh, remind you about our, our friends at SWAT Fuel. SWATFuel.com, they've got a new, they actually just redesigned their web store. So you guys want to go and check those guys out. Go to SWATFuel.com. It is uh, SWAT Fuel for your brain. And <laughs> I, I didn't even mean to do that, but while we're on the subject, in addition to helping you out physically with your body and, you know, burning calories and so forth, SWAT Fuel is good for the mind. It's good for the brain. It, it gives you clarity of thought. And I'm not even, I'm not joking. You know I'm, I'm not messing around with this stuff. Uh, I, I talked to uh, Dr. Dan, and I said, dude, I said, you need to tell competition shooters to start using it because it gives you – it helps you with your mental focus. And, and am I lying or am I dying, Jared? No, you're you're right. I use it to edit the videos and stuff like that. It gives you, I use it for a lot of different it, things. It gives you clarity of mental focus, and, and that's important. Now, if you guys want to make a purchase at SWAT Fuel, uh, use the promo code SOTG2015. Or one four still works too, but uh, if you do that, you're going to save twenty percent off of your. Have total you checked order. it since the new store? Um, I haven't gone and made a purchase, so I, I didn't get all the way to the checkout. Uh, when I talked to Dan the other day, I asked him. I said, "You know, I said, is the are the promo codes going to work on the new store?" And he assured me that they would. Okay. Uh, so check those guys out, and. Jared, we still have a thing in here. Uh, this is a Faith in the Patriot promo. Are we are we still teasing them with that, or are we going to just hold off on that? Mm, yeah, let's go ahead and. Well, we haven't really talked about it in a while. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. There's two books coming out. <laughs> how do you have time? I don't know. How do I have time? Uh, it doesn't look like we're going to get to our missionary story. We're already at 41 minutes right now. Okay. You want to say well, all right? So here's the deal. We're going to have a Muslim missionary story for you guys tomorrow. So make sure you tune in tomorrow. Like you wouldn't anyway. I mean, yeah. you know you're going to. Uh, you're here. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm working on some books. Um, the, the previous three books that I mentioned, uh, the the Federalist Papers, the John Locke Collection, the Political Thought of the American Revolution, they're uh, published by all different authors, and they're out there and they're available to you. Uh, the follow-up to the, the Patriot Fire Team book is going to be called Faith and the Patriot. And essentially, it's uh, our subtitle. I, have, I don't have an official subtitle yet, but uh, you know, do I have to be a coward to be a Christian, or do I have to be a pacifist to be a Christian, or can a person of faith actually fight and not be a sinner? And the answer is yes. But we talk about why, and it's not just me saying why. In the book, there's innumerable lessons and there's historical precedent and so forth. So that's coming up. That's actually in the, it's in the editing process right now. Uh, the second book that we've got available to you, and I'm looking for a copy of it and I don't have it in here, but it's going to be called the, uh, the five strategies uh, that could save your life. Is that not correct, Jared? I think that's correct. Five, and what we're doing uh, is tips I, from a professional bodyguard. You guys may or may not know that your beloved host, Professor Paul Markle, has, has been a professional bodyguard, and I spent a lot of years providing professional security uh, as a United States Marine, uh, as a private security contractor, as a professional bodyguard. And what I've done is I've compiled a book, and it is simple strategies that I use that the, the protection teams that I worked with used uh, to keep millionaires and, and people safe, people who actually had genuine threats against them. Jared, what's, what is exactly – I'm, I'm terrible about stuff like that. It's my own daggum. He made the, he made the uh, title, and he couldn't remember it. It's called Five Strategies That Could Save Your Life. I think okay. that's what you said. Yeah, Five Strategies Tips That Could Save Your Life. from a professional bodyguard. Yep, and that's me. So that, that book actually is in the final edit stage right now. We have a proof copy in yeah, our we, hands. Yeah, he's, Jared's holding one of, one of uh, a couple of proof copies. Uh, we're going through it. It's going to be in the final editing stage. And so le legitimately, by the time you listen to us next week, Jared, I think that that will be ready to go next week. Uh, I don't see any reason yeah, why I, I wouldn't think so be. too. Well, yeah. Yeah. You want to order another proof copy after this one or mm -mm. No, you, know? you do that one then you do the final final edit publish. So okay, anyway, so what we're going to do is Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. So <laughs> lots of stuff and you're like, "Uh, do you want to tell them how they're going to My now nah, we'll, nah, we'll wait, but to, well, here's the deal. If you're not following Student of the Gun on either social media, if you're following us on social media, okay, cool. If you're not following us on social media because you hate Facebook, you hate Twitter, I don't do that, I'm not a teenage girl. Okay, cool. But 
you're listening to me via an electronic device right now. I know you are. It's either a laptop or an iPod or an iPhone or something. Go on there and sign up for the the Student of the Gun newsletter, the the weekly broadcast. Go to studentofthegun.com, click on, you know, put your first name, your email address, uh, and then it's going to send you a little thing in an email that says, are you sure you want to do this? Please confirm. And you say, yes, I'm ple- I'm going to confirm that. Do that, and then you'll never miss out. You'll always know what is new, what is cool, what is going on with Student of the Gun. Uh, because every time we have a new product, a new book, a new whatever, Jared sends out an email, a broadcast. And uh, we've, I've actually... And for those of you that are subscribed, you got Dad's email. You got his letter to you guys on Saturday. So there you have it. I know that was Friday evening, I think. Mm. Well, this weekend. Anyway, but it is the end of a Monday broadcast. We're all done. So, Jared, cue up the bumper music, brother. Cue out that cue the that Madison Rising outro. You guys know what it is. Get you all antsy in your pantsy there. You know, but you know what, Jared? I, I think they hear it at first and they get excited, and then when they hear it the second time, they get a I little. I think their hearts drop. They get a little bit sad, but don't be too sad because we're going to be back tomorrow. And in the meantime. I want you to have a tactical brain. I want you to remember you're a beginner once, but you absolutely 100% you need to be a student for life.